Before I start, I found the ID on the floor, Kerobian, London Business School alumni. I don't know who's missing. His, he lost it, I don't know for what reason. <laughs> it was lying, so I'm there. <laughs> You're welcome. I mentioned in the introduction, this is uh, one of my newer talks. Uh, I held it for the first time last week on Wednesday in Luxembourg. Uh, who of you is concerned in any kind of way with derivatives, derivatives pricing, derivatives analytics? Oh, not that many. <laughs> but, but I guess in the end, the major topic can be applied to many, many other scenarios. But this derivatives analytics thing is something we are very active in. Uh, but this whole multivariate time series analytics part, which is mainly done or uh, almost completely done in R, can be applied to many other scenarios as well. Uh, but I guess you will get the idea in the end what this combination uh, might bring with regard to insights and risk management um, uh, uh, metrics, if you like. Um, first, I thought to uh, delete all the about me things. In Luxembourg, I've been giving the first talk. Here, I've been giving so many talks, I thought everybody would know me by now. Uh, but when I noticed before the break that we have many, many new people in here, and I was asked uh, during the break what my background is, what we'll be doing. So it might make sense to say a few words about what I'm doing. So I'm founder and managing partner of the Python Quants Group. As the name suggests, we fully focus on Python for quant finance. These days, not only Python, but I would say rather an open source technology for quant finance. Uh, we're doing training, providing technology, and, and the major uh, uh, revenue pillar, if you like, is development and consulting work for financial companies like hedge funds, asset managers, banks, um, exchanges, uh, index providers, and so forth. Uh, we offer a platform which allows data science in the browser. It's Data Park. If you Google that up or go to uh, datapark.io, you can sign up for free. Uh, our free trial accounts are unlimited; they are open as far as far as we can, or as long as we can afford that. Uh, so, if you want to do Python in the browser without installing anything, you're not, al not allowed to install it on your uh, corporate machine. Uh, this might be a way to use uh, Python and R uh, rather efficiently. I've written a few books. I guess this is the most uh, popular and successful one, Python for Finance. It's actually kind of uh, written like a reference work. You find single chapters covering different topics like time series analysis, uh, web stuff, or Excel integration, uh, you name it. Um, 605 pages, and to get all the codes on the quant platform, you can immediately execute it. Times are gone where you need to use a CD or even have to type the code. Very easy, all Jupyter notebook based, and pretty, pretty fun from my point of view. This is a little bit more involved, and here you see uh, that we are indeed doing a little bit of derivatives analytics with Python. This doesn't explain Python at all. Um, it only shows the math and finance and the Python code, but it doesn't explain why the Python code looks as it looks. Um, but with the red one, you can understand what's going on here. This is a new one. I just finished it and uh, I've sent it out one and a half weeks ago to the reviewers. Uh, it's about a list of volatility and variance derivatives, so obviously quite product oriented. It's an outgrowth of a project that we have done for Deutsche Börse Urex. And as the name suggests, uh, completely focuses on volatility and variance uh, topics. Obviously, a Python based guide. What else? Um, for the curious, uh, I will tweet later on uh, the, uh, the link to this presentation. Uh, I've listed here, just for reference, a few, uh, a few more um, things. And here is my Twitter account, DYGH. So if you want to have the slides, just follow me on DYGH, and you will get everything about events, talks, finance, whatever I think is interesting and what we are doing, actually. Hopefully enough about me. Uh, now to multivariate vector autoregression with R. Um, I have to say that in particular because the rest will be in Python. Um, but before we start with R, uh, I do the data processing and the data gathering in Python. Uh, a few imports here. And I will work with the Eurostox 50 and VStox data. Uh, you see volatility indices and stuff like that are what I like, uh, what I've been working on for quite a while. Um, but we will also use, obviously, a few R libraries like SU, XTS for time series, and VARs in particular. This might be the, the most specific package, if you like, for vector autoregression. Very powerful 
library, You've, you don't find anything comparable in the Python world. Um, I get public data, open data, as they call it these days, uh, from the stocks.com uh, website. I parse it here with, uh, retrieve it and parse it with uh, pandas. So nothing special about that, but uh, this introductory example will uh, only work with uh, monthly data. Just shrink down the whole thing um, to get a, a, a quite a small data set compared to what it was originally. So when we have a look at the data, and this might be anything else that is of interest to you, but this is the, uh, the, the data from the stocks website with regard to the, the V stocks here. You see this kind of the main index, uh, V2TX, and the sub-indices, uh, which are used for different purposes. The first two are usually used to interpolate the, the main index, actually. But again, this is just an introductory example um, that I've chosen because I've been working with this data set quite a bit. Uh, then the Eurostox data, quite standard. Uh, this might be more of a, of a standard thing for, for the majority of you. Um, the parsing here is a little bit more involved. You see a few more lines, but in the end, it's the same thing. I use pandas to read the data, the file from the website, and parse it and get or end up with a data frame in the end. Same thing, a few indices, uh, major index is the second column here, SX5E. Nothing special about that, uh, but I still want to reduce uh, the whole thing to two columns only that I end up with a data frame which only contains two, uh, the two main indices I want to work with. In order to get the data into R, I now chose uh, maybe not the most elegant way, uh, but it's an easy one here for me. I write this data frame object as a CSV file to disk, which I can then read with R. So with a little bit of trickery, I could do this uh, in the runtime here myself. I will show a few examples later on, but this at least uh, lines of code wise, um, this is uh, the most efficient way. If it's the most elegant, again, uh, you can debate that. Um, just to get a glimpse of what we are talking about, uh, above you see the, the VStox index and below the Eurostox 50 index, and you see that the two time series are more or less highly uh, negatively correlated. Whenever you see kind of a drop down in the index, you see the spike here at the end of, uh, or the beginning of 2009, or end of 2008, you see the, um, the highest point here during the last big financial crisis, and a few others, smaller ones, or medium ones, if you like, in between. And uh, this is the data. The monthly uh, time series are correlated with minus um, dot 33. That's our data. It has now come to vector order regression. Um, in principle, a VAR model is an N equation, N variable model in which each variable is explained by its own lagged values, the historical ones. For example, the five last values, if you like, or the ten last values, plus the current and past values of the remaining N minus one variables. So, this is the, the, the language-wise description. Uh, let us get a little bit more mathematical. Uh, in structural form, such a model might represent an economic or financial system with a vector of the means here in this formulation, a variable set uh, with time index uh, t. So all the things that you see here, the, the, the lowercase uh, characters are vectors and the, the capital case la uh, letters are matrices. And the equation above is what is called uh, the structural form of such a problem. And you see it's assumed that the residuals here, the, the UTs, that they are normally distributed and so forth, and in particular that they are non-correlated. Um, pretty close to regular least squares regression, but there are a few things uh, involved, especially the ones that you see uh, in the last line here. Um, but before just a point, typically, you don't see it in structural form, you see it in that form here, um, where you have the set Ts on the left-hand side which you might be used to from, from other formulations. And the assumption is that, obviously I said it before, the normally distributed uh, uh, noise, so to say, has an expectation here of zero. Um, and only we have a positive um, covariance matrix or the diagonal, if you remember that, is uh, positive for uh, the special case. Um, we have these um, noise terms on the, on the same 
uh, time point, actually, and zero otherwise. So we don't have any correlation between the noise terms over time, uh, only for uh, the cross-section, if you like, of the data. Uh, <laughs> that's more or less it, what I have uh, with regard to the theory. When you have a look, uh, this is kind of something I really like about the R world. Uh, there are two documents accompanying uh, this library. The one is more or less kind of only a manual description, and the other, the other one is kind of explaining not in, that, in every detail, but at least on a level that you can grasp what is going on in a theoretical fashion, what the library does. So you have this kind of technical document, and you have the one explaining the theory behind the things that are going on. Uh, I've never seen this uh, on that level before in the Python world. In Python, uh, you might be happy if you find uh, a real PDF or whatsoever. Uh, usually, you only have your doc strings. Um, so I really like that about the R world, actually. We can get better in Python as well. Uh, so you remember we have written the data on disk, and this is now the part where I read the data uh, with R, actually. Um, two lines of code suffice, uh, and I have the data in my R runtime, and I can start working with it. Um, and working with it is, is in principle, pretty easy. Um, this single line of code that's just with two breaks um, already generates uh, this multivariate var model in R, and we start with the most simple one where we say, oh, this uh, shouldn't say LH, this should be LAC. Uh, we have one LAC only, so we say only the last observation explains what is going on today. Only yesterday's prices are important for what is happening today and not what has been happening seven days before that. Um, and we say we only want a regression with a constant only. So in the end, what this model will, de will deliver is kind of a, a stable uh, level, uh, no trending at all, no seasonality or whatsoever. It says, well, on average, it was at the level of 10, and we have a standard deviation around that. That's, that's it. This is the most simple uh, thing um, that you can do with this model. You can do many more complicated ones. I have these examples later on, uh, but let us start with a simple one. If you're interested in, in what the, the numerical results are, you, you get it by the summary function here. You get the estimation results. Uh, oops, sorry. this is a little bit, this is very sensitive when I click on that. I should do it that way. And that way, and you can scroll down and then you see all the information about the single uh, equations, the solution of the equations, the, the standard errors, t-values, and so forth. Also about the estimated covariance matrix of residuals and the correlation matrix of the, of the residuals. So you get quite a bit of information uh, with regard to this, um, yeah, to this uh, model estimation. Nothing that much of an interest. I guess such a picture says more. Uh, what we uh, see here is kind of the historical fit how well does this model fit the uh, time series? And it works uh, quite well. You can talk or argue about that. You see the deviations are, to a large extent, quite substantial. But in principle, it is able, the simple model, to fit what we have seen. Uh, you can always argue about fits, uh, but here we have kind of a rather erratic time series, so you wouldn't expect kind of a perfect fit. And here you see what we will be interested in is kind of the forecast. Given this model, and now doing a five-year forecast. So you might have noticed that my data starts at the beginning of 1999. So we have quite a few years, uh, roughly 200 months. You see it here. And after 200 months and a few, we are now starting this forecast. But you see this is kind of uh, simplistic in a sense. It diverges to the expected mean, and you have your standard deviations around that. So it doesn't say that much. It doesn't mimic these peaks or whatsoever. It's a very simple approach. You say, well, from there, we have yeah, calculated the expected value. Um, here you see this has, this has had a higher average, so it converges a little bit to this higher average. And here we had a little bit lower average, so it converges to the lower average. Very simple. Uh, but I said it as an introduction, it's the most simple thing you can do. But still, we get some kind of forecast for five years. The question is, what do you want to do with it? Now let us do it a little bit more uh, sophisticated. Uh, what I'm now doing is using 12 lakhs and a seasonality of 12 lakhs. Um, in the sense that before it's only one month, that should define the next one. Now I say, let's have a look at the last 12 months. And typically, we would expect a seasonality over the years. 
for example, spiking volatility, whatever month or whatsoever is going on. So one year might be something we can be working with, and we are not only working with the mean, but also with the trend. So if we take type equals both, um, we have a little bit more flexibility in a sense that we get slopes as well. So we get seasonality, slopes, and the level. So much more information, and 12 legs as well. This problem to solve involves a much larger matrix um, of values than we have seen before. Um, so the fit gets a little bit better. You see here the, uh, the deviations, actually. But this looks almost similar. But let us see what happens uh, here. This is the same thing just for the other time series. A uh, little bit better fit. But now you see a complete difference in terms of the forecast, actually. Um, now we have something like seasonality. You see, we have over time, we have kind of uh, a peaked and with uh, lower values, our mean, and we have kind of the same thing for our standard deviation or confidence interval. It's not a standard deviation. It's the wrong word. I said it before. Here we have the uh, confidence interval of 90%. So uh, what's happening here is that you do a few simulations, actually, and say, well, this is kind of uh, the confidence of 90%. Uh, the evolution of the time series in the future should lie between the two uh, red dashed lines or pointed lines, actually. And here you see as well, it's kind of it's going down, coming up. You have this seasonality effect and the, the confidence interval around that. Looks a little bit more realistic. I would rather believe in that than in the other one. But if this is kind of the future, we will make that check later on. And this is actually the technology we will use for a completely different set of data, which you might have never seen before such data. That's the reason why I started this introductory thing uh, with data which is quite common, which you can retrieve from a, from a public website. The other data set that I'm using is proprietary. We have generated that uh, uh, from, a, from a similar context. But again, this is kind of non-typical data, if you like. So uh, let's come to this non-typical data. This is data from model calibration. What is model calibration? It is a numerical optimization routine in the end that looks for parameters for a given model that best replicate market observed option quotes. So in our case, what we are working with is with uh, options, in particular call options on the VSTOX volatility index. And if you have a model like that one, which is the kreen bischler uh, Longstorff model from a paper 1996, those of you who are interested, they might notice that it is exactly the same as the cox ingersoll ross short rate model called square root diffusion. And we have three parameters in this model. This is the kappa, the mean reversion parameter, theta, the long-term level, and sigma for the uh, volatility of the volatility in our case. So we have three parameters which you can use to calibrate this model to best replicate market-observed options. So if you think back in the history of option pricing, 19, 1973, Black, Scholes, Merton, uh, the major breakthrough was to say, well, we have in principle five parameters that define the value of an option, of a call option on index, for example. And once we have figured out what these five parameters are, we can derive the option price. So here in this case, it's the other way around. We say the market provides us with the option prices, with the market quotes. And what we are looking for is kind of the parameters that best replicate the things that we observe in the market, to then use the model to later price different things with it. So this is kind of the setup that we have. And the problem of model calibration is illustrated by this chart. This is out of my new book, um, where you see um, that given a set of market quotes, this is the blue line above, uh, what we try to do is to get the model prices, so to say, on the line. So in a perfect case, we would have all the red dots perfectly lying on the blue line, and all the differences here would be zero. But with a model which has only three parameters, it's pretty hard to do perfect calibration. Uh, for a very small set, like one option or maybe two or three options, this might work. But here for these uh, seven options, it doesn't work. You can see we have deviations which are beyond the tick size. Tick size here is five cents. So this is the largest deviation, small. These are very well replicated. But in the end, you would say this is kind of a good fit. So people can work with that. Uh, we are good enough. Um, and behind this calibration, we have particular values for kappa, theta, and sigma. And these values uh, we have here in the Pandas data frame. I read them from disk, um, written by a completely different uh, procedure. And we have this data set over time, starting at the first trading day, 2014, up until the last trading day in the first quarter, 2014. 
So we have uh, three months of parameters. Uh, the initial value, obviously, uh, is also <laughs> influenced. The initial value means the, the spot value of the V-stocks. Then we have kappa theta sigma. I mentioned it a few times before. And here the last column is not important for what we're going to do later on, but this is just a mean squared error of the uh, fitting procedure. So you see, they're all quite well. Uh, all here in this case uh, below um, dot O1, actually. Um, the picture, like always, says more than a thousand words. Uh, we have here everything illustrated graphically. You see above the VSTOX index changing over time as a mean reverting uh, a time series, so there's no positive nor negative trend over longer periods of time. You see kappa rising from below th uh, 3 to roughly about 5. Uh, theta like varying around 16.5 and sigma varying around 4.5, something like that. So this is the time series data we want to work with. And actually, later on, we will divide this in kind of what we call these days the training data set and the test one, or as it was called uh, back then, uh, in sample and out of sample uh, data. And we will uh, try to fit our model to the first two months and try to predict the third month here. So we said, well, uh, let's uh, play the game. We are at the end of February, and let's try to predict the market. And this is what I want to do with regard to the parameters as well as uh, with regard to the problem of pricing and derivative. Uh, it's nice to have a forecast for the parameters, but this doesn't help me at all. <laughs> I want to get uh, derivatives prices forecast, or in this case as well for the, for the VSTOX index. Now let's come to the VAR model. Same procedure, same things that we have seen uh, before. I'm uh, first crunching the data and dividing the data set. Um, and writing it as a CSV file to disk, which I can then later on read with R. Um, just to get a check, our out-of-sample period, our forecast, so to say, uh, will comprise 21 trading days. This is just this, uh, this 26 uh, thing here. So this is writing the data to disk. This is just to check how many days we want to forecast, um, so to say, our out-of-sample data set. You have seen this before, but now for a different data set, we read the data from the CSV file written on disk uh, into the R runtime. Uh, we now work with the five lags and a seasonality of five. We're working with a daily data. So what I'm saying here is kind of the last five observations define um, what uh, shall happen in the future and that we have a seasonality of five days representing one week, five trading days, one week. You see the fits here. Um, and the differences are quite low, actually. See it's a little bit uh, smaller data set, so you can better see what's happening here. Um, but this is only for, for one thing to illustrate what's going on. Um, this is nothing of particular interest for us. Uh, we are more interested in how well this whole thing can predict the future and not how well it fits uh, the past, actually. Um, but here you see now the forecast, the picture is quite a bit small, I scroll it down. What we do here is, and you see it, oops, why does it move? Where does this cursor actually come from? <laughs> There's one cursor over there. Um, 21 trading days is what we want to uh, predict, the number I mentioned before, with a confidence interval of 75%. And this is kind of what this whole thing spits out. So for our four time series sub data sets, we get over our 21 trading days. So to the left, this is our in-sample data set, uh, two months, January, February, and this is the out-of-sample data set. This is March 2014. You find this data um, here, just a lookup of the attributes of uh, my prediction object in the forecast attribute stored, so I, what I'm doing here, and I mentioned before, I've chosen the way to write stuff as a CSV file to disk and to read it with uh, R. There are other ways to do that, and this is R push and R pull. Now I'm going the way and I'm pulling data from the R runtime to the Python runtime without writing anything to disk. And in this case, I'm defining new uh, data objects here, and I'm pulling these four data objects into the R runtime. And they have the same name, actually, in the end. See it here, um, 
initial values is supposed to be the coppers, uh, the thetas, and the sigmas, actually. So we have four new data sets. And all the four data sets, they contain the main forecast, the upper level, and the lower level. So we have three time series. If you remember, this blue one and the, the red one around that. This is just housekeeping, if you like. Um, I am defining for my three different data sets, expected lower upper, I'm defining da uh, data frames, um, and I'm defining the starting point here that they come together, where we say this is the last observational point that we have. And now you see the importance of forecast. So what you see here right now, I mean the code to generate that is not that interesting. I explain what's happening here. Um, the dashed lines are all our forecasts. Obviously yellow the upper one, blue the expected, the mean one, and the red one the lower one. And the solid lines, the blue ones, these are the real values. So this, this was the market. And the forecasts are based on information that we had up until the last, which in that case was 28th of February. Um, so you see, at least at the end, this is, if you like, if you take this as a measure, this is the worst forecast. But here you see, actually, with our 75 confidence interval, the market has been lying really in our confidence interval, actually. And here as well, it has been a little bit lower in the beginning. But here actually is lying in our 75% confidence interval. So it doesn't look too bad, actually. But again, this is not our measure uh, of success because the parameters are nothing we are looking for. What we are interested in is kind of, um, well, maybe I should, uh, I should differentiate. For the first one, this might be interesting. If we say if we are able to forecast the V-stocks, index, this is, this is a worth in itself. This is a value in itself. Uh, but not the parameters. Kappa, theta, uh, sigma, they're not kind of a value in itself that I can uh, forecast them. What I want to do is kind of price or get a price forecast for my derivative instrument, given the history of the parameters and the initial value. So let us now introduce uh, the machinery that we need. And this is our library, DX Analytics. You can Google that up. This is all open source. Uh, DX-analytics.com is the website. There is the link um, here. We find all the documentation, and this is the GitHub repo. And it's a library which allows you to do uh, yeah, advanced, sophisticated derivatives analytics for also multi-risk and exotic derivatives, uh, and also for rather complex derivatives portfolios. What we do with it right now is nothing really special in a certain sense, because we are only interested in a single option. So uh, you could do that uh, differently, but obviously I'm using our own library because I have uh, many more additional steps uh, in my mind. Actually, the, the library is characterized by, by two major things. The one is the global valuation approach, bringing back office analytics, which you might know from, or, or yeah, the concept which you might know from uh, XUA calculations, for example, uh, with the non-redundant modeling of error risk factor and so forth to front office analytics. So uh, it's, a, it's a really consistent non-redundant modeling approach, all in all. Um, and the other assumption is unlimited computing resources. I mean, this is just kind of a hypothetical thing. Obviously, compute resources are limited for everybody, but uh, thinking 10 years back and thinking of smaller companies these days, I guess there are things that have been financially not feasible. Even a few years ago, uh, smaller hedge funds, as I mentioned, and so forth, can afford these days. Uh, things that have been unthinkable a few years ago are now implemented on a daily basis. So these two things are driving the whole thing and not like uh, we should use the most computationally efficient uh, thing. No, we are using the most flexible one, Monte Carlo simulation, but this in the end is the most computationally demanding, typically. But it works quite well even on small machines like mine. Now, if you're interested, um, I've just provided two links. When you later on come back to the slides, uh, the one link is to the quick start, which walks you through the basics, and the other one is illustrating how to do a more complex thing, and here you see parallelization is built in. This is running on a 32-core instance at, uh, uh, of Amazon, actually, so it all works quite well. It's quite scalable, um, and uh, I wouldn't say that it's, it's a physics for, for the big banks out there, but for, for the medium-sized hedge funds, it works quite well, um, actually. 
Uh, let us model the VStocks index with the library. A few imports, nothing interesting. And here you see that we define a market environment. The details are not that relevant, but be assured if you have a, a model which, uh, which represents something like a volatility index, uh, you need to provide a few assumptions. And mainly what you see here is that we provide the initial value, the kappa, the theta, all the things that we have seen before. We need the final day, the currency for that, and also the Monte Carlo parameters here, 50,000 path and a weekly discretization. All technical housekeeping um, details are not that relevant. But in the end, once we have done the housekeeping, we can easily define a square root diffusion process, which we are talking about all the time, and simulate the VStox index given our parameters. And here you see a picture representing the first 10 uh, simulated paths of, um, of uh, the 50,000 that we have generated. Um, and you see it here, it starts at the beginning of uh, January and it ends um, here in uh, April, actually. So the VStox option, this is our object uh, we are after in the end. Um, we, we single out a single option, and in particular, it's a call option with a strike of 19, and which has a majority of uh, 18, uh, the 18th of uh, April, actually. Uh, the data set for the first quarter of the VSOX option, I think, contains uh, 46,000 observations. So it's kind of a huge data set. And we single it down to a single time series over uh, the three months, actually. This one single option is what we are looking for. Um, and if you visualize that, you see here the, the price, the, the market quote time series for our option. Again, it's a call, uh, majority in, in April. Um, and has a strike of 19. So this is the price thing. And what we want to do later on is that we say, well, this is our history. We say this is in sample, and we want to forecast the third month. This is what the whole exercise is all about. To this end, to model the option, uh, a few more things that we have to assume. Uh, but in the end, it's more or less only the strike, the majority, and the payoff. And then we are done. 